welcome to the Fiji Symposium 2019 here in Cairo, Egypt, where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by Mr. Rory McMillan from uh, McMillan Keck. Rory, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Now, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about uh, data privacy. Uh, I know that you've been involved in uh, a report. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what are the main findings of the Security Infrastructure and Trust Working Group report on data privacy issues of emerging technologies that you've been involved with? Thank you. Yes, we've been looking at artificial intelligence, uh, big data, machine learning, and how that's being used in digital financial services and the sorts of dilemmas, policy problems, challenges that it's throwing up. Now, the first thing is these uh, technologies are creating great opportunities for financial inclusion by being able to better assess uh, risk of individuals using their uh, alternative data um, when traditional uh, data is not necessarily available from uh, credit reference bureaus because maybe people have never borrowed before or perhaps uh, uh, they've never submitted uh, enough data to these companies to enable um, uh, a, a real risk assessment to be made. So typically uh, lower income populations have not had the benefit of uh, what you and I would be used to having as financial services. Um, and so the great opportunities are arising, but at the same time um, there are consumer protection and data privacy uh, concerns that need to be uh, addressed. Um, these arise uh, in, in the work we looked at three uh, stages of the customer journey. Um, uh, what the customer learns and is asked to agree to when coming on board to take on a financial service. Um, then secondly, during the journey, what sort of uh, conditions, restrictions apply to the use of their data uh, and what risks arise uh, that need to be regulated. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if problems have arisen in the provision of the financial service, um, what sorts of accountability um, c uh, challenges uh, are, are faced because of the nature of big data and machine learning? And what we're finding is that, firstly, uh, a, a key element of, of consumer protection and data privacy law is about notifying the consumer of the risks they may face and asking them to consent, particularly to use of personal data. This is very uh, challenging and complex in the situation of uh, big data because um, typically uh, the uh, providers are looking to collect as much data as they possibly can, whereas one of the core principles of data privacy is to minimize it. You call it data minimization. Only take what's relevant, proportionate, necessary for what you're going to do. Likewise, uh, uh, one of the goals is to tell consumers the purpose to which their uh, data is is going to be put. But with the machine, machine learning, um, very often the algorithms are running their tests and detecting patterns on top of which further machine learning, which becomes independent of even the initial coding, is occurring so that the provider may not even know what it's going to learn from um, the, the machine learning. So it's difficult to tell the consumer the purpose to which the data will be put, all of which puts a lot of pressure on this model of the consumer consenting to data being used. Um, it, it leaves a great imbalance between the consumer who, as we all know, anytime we're clicking the box, I consent, nobody really knows what they're consenting to. Um, and so there's a, there's a need perhaps to look beyond this notion of consumer control over their own data to uh, figuring out how actually better to embed privacy principles throughout the design of these services. In the actual provision of services um, themselves, we are facing challenges around um, things uh, like uh, ensuring the accuracy of data that goes into machine learning um, uh, programs, uh, the data that's used um, to train the algorithms, as, as, as we put it. Um, how do you uh, check that that is up to date, is accurate, that, that people's uh, uh, records, um, if they've maybe paid off a loan but that's not re reflected in the data going in, that may affect whether they are ever extended credit or not. Um, there, there are also issues of bias uh, outcomes uh, coming out of um, big data and uh, machine learning systems which are running off essentially a set of historical data about um, population groups, uh, where, they, where they live. You may find that there are uh, geographic parts of a city which have certain uh, historically disadvantaged groups which have been excluded from a lot of services 
And as a result, the algorithms may end up saying, well, those are higher risk communities uh, and not extending data to people who may be within them, even though they actually would be a good credit risk. Lastly, at the end, uh, when it comes to redress and accountability, one of the big challenges coming out of the big data machine learning world is explainability. If you want to hold somebody accountable for anything, you need to ask them to explain how they made the decision. Now, when we're looking at automated decision systems, which are either granting a loan or insurance product based on the, um, the automatic uh, decision making of that system, uh, the deeper the machine learning has run and more complex the patterns it has produced, the harder it is to be able to explain that uh, in any kind of rational redress mechanism. Secondly, typically these codes are the very essence of the business plan. They're trade secrets. It's very hard to get them to be explained. So we're looking at uh, solutions to that, like uh, potential use of counterfactual models where the, you may not be able to explain to the consumer uh, exactly how uh, or why they were refused credit, but if uh, you were able to say, if you're, you, you said that you earned $30,000 a year, if you had said 40000 you would have had that credit. Or you had uh, a certain uh, number of uh, negative things on your uh, insurance record, if you had didn't have those, then you would have had this policy. Um, so there are areas to explore in all of these uh, uh, issues that, that we're looking at, but the challenges are myriad. Um, we're finding that there's a, a sort of a call for help from the engineering, software engineering community, like the IEEE and, and other bodies, which are producing very useful attempts to build ethical systems um, to help work out how should the engineers deal with these things as they're coding. Um, uh, and I think th the area where we need to work next is to figure out how how to uh, equip the engineers with the right ethical principles, um, and then how to set the right sort of regulatory uh, parameters that uh, allows the innovation to occur, to generate um, these services for the unserved while protecting the consumer at the same time. What about technical standards? Are, are technical standards needed to address some of these issues? I think they will be. Um, I, what we're seeing is, uh, I was just mentioning the, the software engineering community, um, they're going to need to be, um, standards are very useful because they're this intermediary level where industry comes together uh, with some collaboration from policy makers and finds a common way of managing uh, things. Uh, they solve a collective action um, challenge. And regulators, I think, uh, are probably going to struggle too early to impose a very heavy top-down solution to the details of these issues. Um, industry can do a whole lot to uh, uh, develop in this area, for example, a sets of standards around what would be acceptable inferential analytics, by which I mean uh, the, what would be an acceptable way uh, for machine learning to develop the profiles of people um, in order to assess their risk, wh what sorts of attributes of a person, uh, whether it's race, religion, um, uh, whatever their uh, gender, other attributes that can be sensitive, when is it permissible and when is it not to ever include these in any sort of uh, machine learning system that's trying to assess risk? Are they all off limits? Can they ever be used? Um, I think also standards would be very helpful to build in for uh, processes, for uh, ensuring accountability, um, so that you have good documentation systems for decisions that have been made in the way the coding is, is, is designed, uh, and uh, processes for involving a human uh, in the loop during the coding, and then human intervention, which is often a part of some of the data protection laws, uh, where consumers have grievances and an opportunity um, to appeal to human uh, being out, outside that computing system. So there are going to be standards that can be helpful, and I think bodies like the ITU and others are going to be very useful in, in hosting and facilitating some of that work. I mean, it seems that it's quite a complex uh, arena, specifically, I mean, particularly because uh, you've got these multi-layers, and like you say, the machines, learning from the machines, and, and in some ways, are they going to be acting autonomously? So will, they, will we be able to regulate for that? I think we're going to have to. I mean, the, the uh, reality is that decisions are being made. 
Um, and the uh, decisions, if they're automated, uh, coming out of a set of, of, of processes, ultimately then they're being made by those who coded them. And as a society, we have regulation of insurance, we have regulation of banking, um, and some of that regulation is about non-discrimination. Um, some of it is about making sure that the information that goes into those decisions uh, is, is accurate, that some effort is made uh, to make sure that uh, consumers are not just being treated arbitrarily. Um, we have, throughout consumer protection laws, uh, notions of fairness, accountability, transparency, FAT, uh, in some jurisdictions, and these will necessarily have to play a role in the way the coding works. As your AI experts will tell you, uh, artificial intelligence uh, does not itself contain values. And so if as society we want our uh, services to be provided w w uh, in a manner that respects some of these values, we'll necessarily have to give some framework uh, regulation. It certainly it sounds like it's going to be a, a, a lot of work for uh, the legal profession, that's for sure, in <laughs> well, this environment. We come, we come up very much behind everyone else. We're still learning the vocabulary and trying to help, but we do notice that at the same time the software engineers don't have even the vocabulary of values necessarily uh, taught to them in, in their, in their uh, computer engineering classes. Um, and this is not surprising. Why should they be? But uh, what is needed now is this dialogue between, in fact, it's not just the legal profession and regulators. We need philosophers, frankly, to be in this game, trying to f help figure out what sorts of uh, uh, values are we trying to protect and how do you balance those against commercial values when the massive collection of data and the massive use of that for advertising and other services is commercially profitable. How to, how to work one's way through that. It's going to require multiple disciplines. Now, this, this symposium is all about financial inclusion and uh, Bill and Mc, Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and we're looking at the, the uh, poorest members of the population as well and trying to access, uh, uh, access uh, fi finance uh, digitally. Um, on this side, of course, I mean, you know, we, we want to avoid the computer saying no, essentially. I think that that's, uh, that's one of the things, like you say, that they've been particularly disenfranchised before. Do you, are you optimistic for the, the future of this environment? I think there's room for optimism and there's also room for caution. Um, I think they, clearly there is an uptake of services uh, occurring through digital means, and this is just tremendous. Um, at the same time, some talk in Kenya of financial exclusion as a result of uh, excessive uptake of some of the digital credit services where consumers were not ready and didn't uh, manage repayment well and found themselves blacklisted. Um, so there's, there's always a lot of positive uh, opportunity and good progress happening. Um, but the reality is we've got to be ready and prepared for managing these sorts of challenges too. We've been hearing comments about uh, people being profiled by their social media uh, interactions and uh, whether they can then access credit because they've said something on Facebook, whether they bought something on uh, on uh, a you know a, a particular uh, um, provider through the internet, etc. I mean, so are, th are those the kind of things that that, uh, that people should be looking out for? Yes, you know, 25 years ago, the New Yorker ran a very famous cartoon, a picture of a dog sitting in front of the computer talking to uh, its dog companion, saying, "You know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog." The thing is today, everybody, or not everybody, they know that you're a dog, they know what kind of dog food you like, whether you prefer horse meat or beef uh, out of your can, they know which is your favorite tree. Uh, there's a lot of data on the user through the browsing history, uh, through our apps and our phones, granting access to a lot of the data, not only location, but everything that we're, we're, we're doing. Um, there are limits to that, but uh, a huge amount of data is, is collected and that profiling is, is, is being done. And uh, one of the contrasts, um, and it's a, again, it's an opportunity as you describe, um, one of the challenges though is dealing with uh, that when our historic way of handling data about people has been to uh, build formal systems of applications by an individual disclosing a whole lot of data about themselves when applying for a service, and then credit reference bureaus collecting a huge amount of information about individuals and scoring their credit worthiness according to uh, 
formal data collection uh, systems which have rules about protecting accuracy and clear uh, opportunities for individuals to call up and say, what's the information you have about me? No, that's wrong. Uh, that's, I didn't lose that job, uh, or uh, I, didn't, I wasn't fined for that, or I wasn't late on that payment. Getting these things corrected. Um, in the big data world, the data's all out there and it's very hard to know. It's being purchased. It's a projected to be a $100 billion industry in about 10 years' time. There's a huge amount. Uh, ensuring that accuracy is a real challenge um, and very difficult for consumers really to get proper access to make sure that it's correct. Yes, so that's a central, central theme. Finally, you've taken the time to be here at uh, this symposium. There's a lot of symposiums around. There's a lot of initiatives. What makes this one particularly uh, important for your calendar? It brings together the financial sector regulators, the telecom regulators and policy makers, brings the World Bank, the ITU, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Bank uh, for International Settlements in a unique sort of combination to talk and that I find tremendous. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us in the studio, Rory, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again in the very near future. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.